Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect, and uh, welcome to this webinar on the design of ship structures. So, uh, this is the first one that I've worked on, and we'll see how this turns out. Let's dive right into the webinar, and then we'll have questions afterwards. I remember being a young naval architect working on this one particularly difficult project where we were design or we were converting a tank into a machinery space and I was sitting on site which was very unusual normally I work in the office and develop the whole design before anybody starts construction but this time I was sitting at the site and they asked me they asked me a question they said so this girder over here it's in our way we want to put a machine right in that spot but the girder is stopping us and this is a big girder you know about 0.3 meters depth, huge flange. So, can we just uh, cut the girder out, they ask? Well, here I am, I'm in a panic. You know, I, I want to make the client happy, but I'm thinking, I, I have no idea. I, I can't run those equations in my head, maybe, maybe not. And then I just stopped and I, I thought about the whole thing from a different perspective. I thought about the functionality, the practical end of it. I turn to my client, and I say, no, no, no. You see, that girder right there, that keeps the ocean on the outside. It keeps the ocean away from the room that you're standing in right now. Oh! Yeah, that changed the entire conversation. Their next question was, so about this other stiffener that we've already cut. And as you can see, that was a game changer for me, is I realized designing ship structures, it's not just about the theory there's also quite a bit of practical effort that goes into it. The theory, those are the rules of the game. They're the unbreakable laws of the physics, all of the equations. But we also have the practical end. This is the strategy for how to win the game. They're kind of like guidelines. They don't teach you this part in school. You have to learn it through the, the work of hard knocks, basically, and on-the-job experience. So today I'm going to share some of that experience and try to explain some of what guides the ship structure or design and some of the reasons behind it. And this is the first in a three-part webinar series. So today I'm just going to focus on structural layout, the big decisions of how do you go from having a hull shape that we want to achieve, how do you go from that to actually designing all the structure that can be strong enough to sustain that hull shape. So let's get into this. The first question is your stiffener spacing. The structure on a ship, we don't just lay it out willy-nilly. We're not throwing beams everywhere. Uh, we actually design our structure based on a grid pattern with regular spacing of all of our structure. And even the larger structure is usually based upon multiples of that grid. So if I say I'm going to put a stiffener every one meter, I'll make sure that my bulkhead lines up on 10 or 15 meters. We're always maintaining that grid. This is important because the very first question you ask when laying out ship structure is, what do I want for my grid spacing? My baseline stiffener spacing. How far apart do I want them? And that's something that you'll try to keep consistent throughout the entire ship structure. Well, this is where theory and practical start to collide a little bit. Because you might think, okay, well, there, there's a good theoretical answer to this. I certainly did. I ran the math. And I thought, well, there's a trade-off. You see, as my stiffeners get closer together, that's a closer distance that my plating has to bridge. So my plating can get thinner. Uh, my stiffeners don't have to support as large of an area, so my stiffeners can get smaller too. And I thought, but there's got to be some sort of happy medium point. I mean, if I have a stiffener spacing of only 30 centimeters, well, that's going to be a lot of stiffeners. So there must be some perfect optimum stiffener point. I ran through all of the math and got a very surprising result. The optimum point is zero zero millimeters for your stiffener spacing. Uh, the math, when you run through all of the weight savings for all of this, uh, you actually do find out that as you get smaller and smaller, there's no trade-off. You always 
lose weight faster by going to smaller stiffeners. Now, granted, that's theory. Theory would point us all the way to having wafer-thin plates with wafer-thin stiffeners, and, and that's just not practical. The practical answer was actually sandwich panels. This was the rational conclusion from the equations. Well, what is a sandwich panel? It's basically just two thin sheets of plate, uh, relatively thin, separated by a core. And the purpose of the core is just to separate those two sheets and be as light as possible. This is something you can buy. It's manufactured all over the world. And it actually does work. Uh, it can reduce the structure weight by anywhere from 5 to 20% on a ship. It's a wonderful invention. So why don't we use it everywhere? I mean, you would think we'd be jumping at the bit to uh, save 20% on ship structure. That's normally the goal, is always trying to create your structure as light as possible. Well, there are two reasons. Number one, sandwich panels are made in factories. They come out as fat, flat plates coming off of the assembly line. Flat plates do not work well with curved hulls. Uh, it's not easy to convert these sandwich panels to curved shapes on site, at least when we're dealing with uh, metal fabrication, which is what most commercial ships are made out of. Yachts, they use composite technology, and that's a different story. But for now, I'm focused on metal and commercial ships. So clearly, already I've mentioned yachts. I've said oh, there's an exception to this guideline. So maybe we could make it work for commercial ships. Well, there's a bigger problem. Welding. Uh, on, on commercial ships, welding is the ubiquitous method of joining anything together. We, the welding will be used for all sorts of joining. That is what we use to bring any piece of metal together. It forms a very reliable connection. Except sandwich panels really do not like welding. Remember, sandwich panels are built with wafer-thin sheets on top and bottom, comparatively. And it's very easy for a welding torch to accidentally just burn straight through that wafer-thin sheet. You can't do it easily. You have to intentionally reinforce the sandwich panel with extra thick metal at every location that you plan to weld beforehand. And this is where the practical end stops us. Because I just said that I have to now manufacture my sandwich panels in a factory, removed from the ship, and before I manufacture them, I have to know where every single weld will ever be on that ship for its entire lifetime. Well, that's just not practical. We can't predict the 30-year history of a ship. And so that's why sandwich panels are not used in general on ships. There are a few specialist applications where they work great. But in general, the practical answer is we still stick with normal stiffeners, um, which are conventional stiffeners welded to flat plate, just like you see in this picture here. Now, the smarter of you will have noticed I still haven't answered the question of stiffener spacing. And this is because the math said go to zero, but what does the practical stuff say? The practical says as small as possible. Okay, again, what's the number? Where's the answer? And the answer is you have to think about the humans the welding axis. We need space between the stiffeners so that a welding torch can actually fit in there and actually weld the, the stiffener onto the plate. That's what's happening in the shipyard. The other thing, though, is we need to think about the humans. Ships are not made by robots. There are a lot of humans that go into assembling a ship. And when, if you've ever sat on one of these stiffeners, uh, you'll notice that they actually have very thin tops. They're, they're not comfortable to sit on. Most people will instead choose to sit between the stiffeners, resting on the flat plate. That's important for our shipyard, because we don't want our welder focused on how are they going to balance on top of this little tiny stiffener. No, no, no. We want them focused on getting a good weld. So, practical ship design. The practical answer is a minimum of 400 millimeters for your stiffener spacing, or the width of a human body. 
And so the more astute of you are going to be breaking out tape measures and measuring to see how wide each of you are to get an average spacing. Uh, you know, that, that's definitely how it goes, basically. And, and that's a great example of how theory says one thing, practical design provides us guidelines that are completely different. Okay, so we've set our grid. Now we have to put things into the grid. And ships are not uniform. We don't just have one stiffener that we copy all the way across. Uh, optimum ship structure has a hierarchy where you start with the weakest element, the plate, and then that's reinforced by stiffeners who are then reinforced by bigger beams, uh, girders and web frames. They're, they work the same as stiffeners, uh, but they're just about twice the same size. Those big, those make up whole sections of hull plating that are about uh, anywhere from three to six meters long. Then those are all reinforced by major beams, things that are as tall as you, big structures that we have to have custom build. All of that then feeds into the bulkheads of the ship, big transverse bulkheads that run the entire width of the ship. And this is the hierarchy that we plan on. This is the hierarchy that you also have to make sure that you're maintaining when you specify all of your structural components. And the way you'll typically do it is you'll look at the flat shape of the hull, or you'll look at the shape of the hull. You will then plan where each one of these things are going to be in your hierarchy. You know, you'll say, I want stiffeners at every grid spacing. I want girders every fifth stiffener, major beams every 20th stiffener, bulkheads uh, at specific specified locations. And you have to make sure that you're always going upwards in that hierarchy. This is one of the key elements for structural layout. You want to have more stiffness and more strength each time supporting your structure. And this is really better explained through some examples. So let's take a look at this cross section of a ship right here. Uh, now, when I talk about more stiffness, Two basic rules for this. Direct compression, directly pushing in line with a piece of metal, that is incredibly stiff. In comparison, bending, pushing perpendicular to a piece of metal, is very, very weak. That's important because most of our structures are designed for bending. Uh, if you look at this hull, remember that there's water pressure on the outside pushing in on that hull most of that pressure is pushing perpendicular. So we've got to think about, are we looking at bending or direct compression in each of these connections? Look at point at connection number one here. This is one where we don't have great structural hierarchy. You have vertical loads going along that vertical bulkhead. Okay, direct compression, very strong bulkhead. But then it lands on top of a deck with no reinforcement, it's just landing on top of the stiffeners. Maybe that's okay, but I worry about the sections between the stiffeners. And they worried about that too, because if you look at point number two, here's the same scenario, only turned horizontal. We now have a horizontal deck, strong compression in the horizontal axis, leading into a vertical bulkhead, but this time they have reinforced the bulkhead with a strong beam on the backside. And so that's a case where we're maintaining the hierarchy. And that strong beam is going to help and take any pinpoint hot, any pinpoint stress loads from that deck and redistribute them. That's a good example of the structural hierarchy. Another bad example as we go further up, point number three, we've got big ass, or excuse me, we've got a big vertical bulkhead uh, going down into a horizontal deck that's just sort of hanging in midair. It's cantilever. That's very, very weak. That's a, the weakest bending scenario you can have, actually. Now, maybe there's some additional support on the sides of the bulkhead that are not included in this cross section, but I'm just judging on what I see in this picture as an example. And we know again that they did it right if you look at point number four. Here again is a giant bulkhead vertically going down, and it's landing on top of the double bottom, that top plate there. And you can see beneath it, it's a little hard to see in the picture, but they have solid plate the whole length right underneath that bulkhead. 
That's an example where we've maintained the same structural stiffness or gone one better. And this is a, these are all great examples. Now, I know I have a mixture of professionals and semi-professionals in the audience, and I'm sure that plenty of them are going to come up with lots of counterpoints to the assessments I've made here. And I would say that absolutely that's why these are guidelines. Uh, guidelines always have exceptions. It's not necessarily saying that you can't do this. It's saying that if you're going to go against the guideline, make sure you have some additional checks to prove it's safe. Okay, let's talk about one of the biggest foils in structural hierarchy, the deck house. This is such a common mistake that there are literal textbooks that are written about this. If you think about a deck house, I, I've told you that you have to maintain increasing stiffness and that bulkheads are at the top of the hierarchy. Well, a deck house is nothing but bulkheads sitting on top of the hull. Right, well, we're already at the top of the hierarchy, so now what? And the answer is, well, if you can't go higher in the hierarchy, you have to at least maintain that same stiffness. And so you see an example there of a good deck house where we have strong vertical bulkheads that started at the deck house and they line up with vertical bulkheads in the hull and we're continuing it all the way down. Even bulkheads in the middle of the deck house at least extend one deck down. That's maintaining that hierarchy. And that's really important because bulkheads also create walls that divide up rooms. So you can see how that's a case where practical structural design is also controlling the layout of my ship. It's an important matter. The other thing is the longitudinal length of the deck house. Uh, there, there's a big temptation with deck houses to narrow them down in the middle, uh, right here, for example, and create this sort of wishbone structure. The problem with that is that the deck house is attached to the hull and it's going to bend with the hull, most likely. So if we look at that deck house, we have strong stiff structure on the forward end, strong stiff structure on the back end. Those can both carry a lot of stresses and we're trying to compress it all through this tiny little wishbone in the middle. That is just begging for the middle section to break. So even though you may not need the space in the deck house, you're going to go with keeping the structural design just to maintain strong structure and prevent things from breaking. And I guess the captain is going to get extra luxurious quarters in that case. Again, that's an example where practical design is governing the layout of our structure. And nothing in the equations will tell you this. This is practical guidelines. And just to prove that this isn't just all pure theoretical knowledge, here is an example where they've actually done this in reality. So take a look at this cruise ship here. And remember how I said you want the deck house, all of the sides of the deck house, to line up with the sides of the ship. Well, think about this cruise ship here. Uh, in a cruise ship, we have a very large deck house. Uh, it's usually larger than the hull. And we have all of these balconies in the deck house. So the first bulkhead of our deck house is actually set in about six feet from the side of the ship. Well, that means then we would have to put a whole second bulkhead in the hull six feet in from the side. And what are you going to do with that? So in this case, this cruise ship here has actually come up with a totally different solution. Look at the line of the hull here and notice how it extends upwards you see how the lifeboats are all outboard of the hull side, and so are the uh, balconies on the deck house. Remember how I said we can have practical structural design governing the layout of the ship. This is a prime example here where they thought it was better to actually have breakable things sticking out from the protected sides of the ship. They thought that was, more impor that was less important than keeping structural hierarchy in their ship. So practical design really does matter. We do use it on real ships. Now, 
here's where I want to justify myself a little bit. And don't worry, we're getting towards the end of this. Why am I talking so much about the hierarchy? Why am I always talking about increasing the stiffness of your ship? Well, there's a couple reasons. Number one is easier engineering. We have the wonderful advantage as engineers that we can adjust our design to better match our equations for higher reliability. And we do that all the time, including with this setup here. If we know that our individual pieces of structure are always supported by things that are stronger and stiffer, then we don't have to worry too much about how parts of one structure interact with another piece of structure, uh, except for some specialized cases. This is also physically responsible in terms of stress diffusion. Again, we're trying to avoid scenarios where one piece of structure has stresses that interact with another piece of structure and they compound. The reason we want to avoid that is because if that, if that scenario is true, where we have interacting structural stresses, I now have to check every single combination on that ship, and I'm going to be here a long time. It's not practical. So we design stiffer structure to help with stress diffusion. In fact, look at this picture right here on the screen. Let me get out of the way. Now you can see these two plates right here and right here. Uh, the green and the, def and the deflection, that's showing you that these are pretty highly stressed in this FEA plot. But notice, here we have strong stiff beams that are, bound, that are on the boundary of that, and the stresses are much lower next to those two plates. That's the stress diffusion of higher, stiffer structures, is we're able to look at those two sections of plate almost in isolation to the rest of the ship, even one piece, even one piece of plate right next to it. That's avoiding the complexity of compounding stress interactions. It not only makes for easier engineering, but it also makes for a more reliable ship structure where avoiding any scenarios that could lead to unforeseen circumstances. And that's why practical design is just as important as the theoretical design. I would say we still definitely need them because otherwise the theory won't be able to tell you things like the stiffener spacing. Do, how did I figure out that stiffener spacing of 400 to 600 millimeters? Well, that started with theoretical knowledge and then working backwards to practical limits. The hierarchy of the structure. Remember how I said, oh, there are exceptions to this. So you need the theory to analyze the exceptions. And yes, they definitely work together. Theory helps reinforce practical design. It tells you when the guidelines don't work. But at the same time, theory doesn't tell you about the limits that this is built in the real world by real humans. Theory doesn't tell you that you don't have an unlimited budget. You have to pick a strategy that's going to be efficient in your engineering applications. And so that's the practical end of structural design. And putting those two together, that's what makes an efficient ship structure. That's how you win the game. Thanks very much. I'm now going to open this up to any questions. Uh, try to keep them focused on structural design if you can. And uh, I will basically answer as many questions as I can. I'm going to step off camera for a second here to go look at the chat window and see what we have. Well, I'm not seeing any questions come through yet. Uh, everybody seems to be stunned into silence, but go ahead and this is a, <clears throat> pardon me, this is part of the advantage of the live webinar is you know, giving you all a chance to ask some more questions about this, um, get some feedback and response. Uh, so go ahead. Uh, I know there's a lot of people in this scenario think, oh, I don't want to ask the dumb question. <laughs> 
most of the time, if you're worried about that, there's somebody else that's thinking the same thing. So go ahead and ask. And I think I just had one. Ah. Nope. Let's see. Well, uh, oh, here we go. I think we have a question that just came in. That, okay, so we have a question from, um, I, I'm terribly sorry I'm going to butcher your name, uh, Omer Bahidir, uh, asking if the Scantling calculations on smaller ships are more forgiving. <sighs> I would actually say the Scantling calculations on smaller ships are probably less forgiving. The major question, and to add some context to this, remember how I've said that structural design is complicated. Uh, Scantling calculations are a set of rules published by class societies who have had time to study this in detail and provide some simplified uh, uh, equations for us to use. The biggest thing that's baked into any Scantling calculations is loads analysis. That, that's the biggest question for any ship is, if I have, say, a three meter wave hit my ship, what kind of pressure is that on my ship plating? What kind of forces do I have to withstand? Uh, that's a very complicated question. Scantling calculations uh, take averages from data with a whole bunch of ships and turn that into a simpler qu uh, if question. Now, there are different sets of Scantling calculations depending on your ship. So are they simpler for ships that are below 20 meters? Things that are what I would classify more as relying on the ISO yacht standards or high speed vessels? The answer I would actually say is that they are, they are less forgiving in that. And the reason for that is because the ship gets smaller, but the ocean does not. And so the size of the waves actually get larger relative to the ship especially when we're talking smaller vessels, uh, they can start driving extremely fast and we have to worry about the vessel slamming into waves. That's a scenario where the boat hits the waves so fast that the water is actually acting like concrete. It, it, it's very hard impact. And these very complicated physics are very, very hard to bake into simplified scantling equations. So I would actually say that they are they're less forgiving because nobody wants to just say, well, put in a ridiculous factor of safety and make your ship too heavy. And I actually just recently attended a, a presentation where we were talking about this. And it was very much focused on higher speed, smaller vessels. Those physics are much more difficult to predict accurately without doing advanced analysis. So Scantling calculations on smaller ships there's a narrower margin there. And I would even say be a little bit more cautious with them to question the Scantling calculations. I hope that answered that. Ooh. Okay, so I just got a very interesting question from um, A Foul Wind. It, wonderful title, by the way. Uh, you know what, here, I'm going to try and pull my text chat a little bit closer so that you don't constantly see me off screen. There. Um, okay, so let me see if I can uh, describe this question a little bit. So if you were welding platings and stiffeners, uh, stiffeners, you get plenty of choices in what you pick for your stiffener shape. And if you, in this case, if you were to use half conduits welded uh, to the, and between the stiffeners perpendicular to the bulkheads. Okay, so I think that's talking about a description where we have stiffeners um, on top of plating and then going across them are the half conduits. Um, would you use a penetrating weld through the conduit to the plating as well to the ridges at the stiffeners. So the penetrating weld versus the fillet weld, what we're talking about here is ways to correctly size your weld and get enough strength. Uh, penetrating welds, 
Uh, I have to be very careful here because I am not an engineer of welding. Uh, there are engineers who specialize specifically in that and know exact details on heat input and material compatibility. Uh, my knowledge extends pretty much to picking the correct size of weld for two pieces of structure to make sure that the weld can carry the stresses that are expected at that point. Uh, and typically the choice comes between a fillet weld, which is if we have two corners of structure meeting, the fillet weld just fills in the corner, versus penetrating weld, where if we have two corners of structure meeting, we're actually going to cut out a piece of that structure and fill in the gap. Um, I would say normally we would be using fillet welds just as a matter of convenience. Uh, they're much easier than penetrating welds and speed matters when you're building a ship. But they are also, um, oh, conduits would be parallel to the stiffeners. Okay. And I would say for that still, most likely we would still be using fillet welds for that uh, as a matter of convenience. Uh, penetrating welds, I normally se select penetrating welds based purely on the strength requirement. Uh, I, I try to be nice to the people that, that are doing the welding and, and pick easier solutions for them. But that's a pretty detailed question that I think I'd have to see a drawing and look at a lot more. Um, I'm afraid I can't give you an exact answer on that one. Oh, here's an excellent question from I do apologize, I'm going to butcher this username, uh, Jamon Cortizas, um, who builds small RC boats using some simple calculation techniques for their design. And how would you approach using finite elements in plastic hulls of RC models? Uh, that's a pretty good question. I, I mean, so since this presentation is on practical structural design, my first answer would be that if you're going to the cost and expense of a finite element model for an RC boat, uh, there must be a really impressive prize at the end of that RC boat race. But uh, to answer the more theoretical of using finite elements, how would I approach that technique? Basically the same way that I would approach it for a larger ship. Uh, finite element analysis is using the computer to solve these equations. Uh, that's this graphic that you see right here is an output from a finite element analysis. And you can see how the computer understands the exact geometry of the ship's structure and the loads applied. Uh, an FEA of a RC boat and plastics would be a little bit more complicated because plastic behaves a little differently. But FEA models can actually handle plastics that's been baked into the software for quite a while. and I would be approaching it the same way of designing all of the structure, putting that shapes into the model, uh, probably with plate structures, which allow me to change the thickness of the different pieces of material in the model as I'm going. And so you can actually iterate on that pretty quickly and try to reduce the weight of your model. Although I can tell you for, if you're talking an RC model boat, you know, something about yay big or even yay big, uh, the forces scale down quite a bit smaller as you're talking small like that. So um, pretty quickly you're in a situation where the plastic has a huge advantage over the loads that it has to sustain. And it, the FEA model would tell you that you could go to extremely thin plastic structures, I would bet. I hope that answers that question. Um, let's see. Any other questions? Uh, does, it, does, does it change a lot when designing ships like tankers, bulk carriers, and container ships? Uh, there's an excellent question. The, the principles do remain the same if we're designing tankers, bulk containers, carriers, all of that. Uh, what I would call the, the large industrial ships where they're trying to carry very heavy cargoes compared to, say, uh, passenger vessels. The biggest thing is that for uh, large bulk carriers like that, tankers and such, there are a few additional scenarios that we have to worry about 
uh, specifically worrying about the weight of the cargo itself. One of the most interesting things actually is uh, liquid natural gas carriers. They have giant containers that are probably 60 meters across with nothing in them. It's just a giant open void 60 meters long. And we put liquid natural gas in them. That it's a cooled refrigerated liquid. Uh, it's cooled down to somewhere around, I believe, minus 163 Celsius. And there's a really important reason that this matters for structural design is we actually have to worry about that cargo sloshing back and forth and a wave from the cargo slamming into the side of the structure. It, liquid natural gas, it actually has um, much higher wave velocities than say water, and you can get phenomenal slamming pressures against the side of your hull. It's so bad that many liquid natural gas carriers actually have a loading restriction where they're not allowed to have their tanks partially full. They actually have to have the tank either completely empty or completely full just to stop that possibility of a wave slamming in. And that's in a great example of how the cargo creates additional scenarios that we have to worry about. Ah, so I see now, a foul wind was ask is following up specifically um, looking at how to manufacture your own um, sandwich plating. I think I see where you're going with that now. And to answer your question about the conduits, yes, you could start to use a penetrating weld for that. Uh, definitely feel free to send me a CAD file. Uh, probably Autodesk AutoCAD would be the best option for that to see what you're looking at. But I will definitely say you're on the right track of trying to find ways to manufacture metal plating on site or sandwich panels on site, uh, which is where they're going. And that's definitely something worth pursuing. Uh, it's definitely a matter, a current area of active research. There's this goal, I will say, to try to minimize the amount of welding required in shipyards. Uh, at least here in the US, the welder is more expensive than the material that they are welding. Welder labor rates uh, dominate ship design. And so we have to find ways to minimize our welding time. And sandwich panels that can be built on site, that has options. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions. Nothing yet. I'm going to take a quick drip drink of water. Mm. So a follow one brought up another question, another point about um, free water moments are uh, more often called um, free surface effects uh, and having cylindrical tanks with pistons through them. Yep, I, I, think, I, I think I see where you're going with that. Uh, I'm going to talk a little more generically about that of what we call using swash bulkheads inside tanks. Uh, this is to stop specifically that sort of sloshing wave that I talked about in LNG tanks building up and most cargo tanks will have this, is bulkheads with holes in them that the water can still, or that the cargo can still flow through the holes slowly, but if it tries to move very quickly through it, the bulkhead stops it. And so we take that large tank and divide it up into smaller pieces so that each small segment can't uh, create large free surface effects. The thing that's really interesting about liquid natural gas carriers is you can't do that in an LNG tank. And the reason is that when you uh, first pour the LNG into this tank, that means the tank itself suddenly cools from about 20 Celsius down to minus 163 Celsius. The, the tank actually contracts as a result of that cooling. There's a noticeable size change in the tank. And so we actually have to design the entire structure to allow it to contract and get smaller. And because of that, we can't easily put swash bulkheads inside the tank or 
they would act as knife edges pushing against the outside of the tank and break it. And that's why you see large LNG tanks don't have um, swash bulkheads in them. It's all about designing this massive, I mean, it's just an amazing idea, actually. You have this thing that is the size of a building, and you're going to suddenly contract it and squeeze it down just due to temperature changes. Uh, that's an impressive challenge for liquid natural gas carriers. It's one of those cases where practical design will not be enough. You definitely need advanced theoretical knowledge on that. It's actually such a huge problem that it's the main reason we don't see brand new LNG tank designs coming out every other day. It, it's a massive engineering effort to design one of these tanks to work safely. Let's see what other questions we have. Uh, let's see. Mm. So Jamon Cortezus, and I, I apologize if I'm saying that wrong, um, has an excellent question about the structural reinforcements of ships. They are generally made with perpendicular shapes, and why are they not made with hexapod geometries, uh, such as a home honeycomb structure? And wouldn't these be mathematically more efficient? The basic answer, I, I don't have a straight answer for you on that one, actually. Uh, this is a question I've wondered myself quite a few times, and it's on my list of things that I want to look at theoretically if I ever get the, the time for it. I think the more practical matter behind it, it again comes to ship production. Uh, if we're doing hexapod style geometries where all of the stiffeners are um, laid out in hexagons, then we have this problem that we need to cut all of our ship structure into these hexapod arrangements. Uh, creating many more intersections. And so we have lots of short stiffeners that we have to weld together versus right now the way we do it with rectangular geometry is you find out that you can just cut holes in the one intersecting stiffener and run a single longitudinal stiffener or a single transverse stiffener the entire length as a single continuous beam. Uh, that makes it easier for the shipyard. There's less welding that they have to do and less cutting. And so I suspect the rectangular arrangement, again, is a practical concern focused on reducing production costs. Uh, let's see, we have another question from, I do apologize if I butcher this, um, Boke, Boke Sykes, a uh, student in mechanical engineering and wants to design a carbon hull for a solar boat that I'm working on, but I have zero hydrodynamic, zero knowledge in hydrodynamics. What is the best place to start? Um, pardon me. <coughs> good question. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm, there's a couple good books that I could point you to. Snamey Principles of Naval Architecture is uh, one book that you can look at, but that's design that is written for professionals that have already taken the courses. Uh, it's usually used as one of the textbooks in college level courses. Um, basic Ship Theory, I think by, I want to say Brian but I might have the, the author incorrect on that one, uh, would be another uh, book to look up. And that will help a lot with the hydrodynamics. Um, Resistance and Propulsion by um, Dominic Hudson et al. That's another excellent textbook that will help with the hydrodynamics. Uh, the, the basic problem that you're going to be looking at really from the hydrodynamics end is picking the correct shape of the hull to try to minimize the resistance. And Resistance and propulsion will, from Dominic Hudson, that will give you a really good start on that. Ah, here's another question from Afal Wind is, have I worked with uh, wooden ships with large tu timbers and glue laminate beams? Thinking. I have not worked with wooden ships specifically I have worked with uh, composite vessels, uh, 
uh, specifically carbon fiber. Once we designed uh, an all carbon fiber vessel that was extremely expensive. <laughs> um, but that, that, that's a great comparative example, I would say. Both wood and carbon fiber are very similar in their material behavior in that they have a strong direction and a weak direction in them so that the orientation of your material matters quite a bit uh, versus steel or aluminum that it's strong in any direction. It's the same strength in any direction. That's what we call uh, metals are what we call isotropic materials, whereas wood and carbon fiber and fiberglass, those would be orthotropic materials. Wood laminates, I've seen several examples with them. They work very, very well. I, I definitely think wood is a good building material to work with. It can be a little frustrating. If you've ever looked up in textbooks, uh, engineers were used to looking up at a textbook and getting one value for the strength of our material and we'll use that as our design property. If you look up the actual material properties for wood, then the question becomes, well, what species of wood? How good was the growing season? How long did they dry it for? Where in the country did you pick this piece of wood from? There's a, a huge variability in it, and that can be a little bit frustrating at times, uh, but it, it is definitely still very useful as a building material. I love the fact that it's a renewable material and wood laminates are an amazing structure. I saw an example actually of a recreation of a vessel where it was a traditional tall ship, traditionally built with wood. The replica of it though, they built with wood laminate, which is combining wood laminate with epoxy and a little bit of fiberglass. Their wood laminates were half the weight of the original wood structure. So it's very impressive as a combined material. <laughs> and yes, I, I know I'm getting the, the names of the, the, or the pronunciation of the names horrible. Okay. Well, I believe, let's see, we have been going for about 50 minutes right now. Uh, I'm going to cut it off at the uh, one hour mark. Uh, are there any other questions left? while everyone thinks, oh, perfect. Just waiting for, uh, see if there are any other text questions coming in. Um, let's see. <clears throat> ah, so one, um, a foul wind mentioned using uh, wind laminates in building construction and not boats. Uh, I have, I've actually seen wooden, wooden laminates in building construction as well uh, with some very impressive results there. Uh, I can't talk too much about buildings because that's the civil engineering side, different load cases, but I can tell you I have seen uh, specifically in one of the universities I went to, it was the forestry building they had a full forestry department there, and their building had this massive 60 foot wide atrium completely unsupported in the middle, and it just had huge laminated wooden beams supporting the roof across that atrium. That is aesthetically a gorgeous sight. Uh, the wood just really looks beautiful in, in my opinion. Mm. And I believe we have a question here about uh, catamarans versus single hauled for seafaring vessels. That is going to be a huge debate. Th there are pros and cons to both hulls. Uh, I will say that they both have their uses. The general debate of catamarans versus monohulls, um, th the single hull will be able to handle larger roll angles which will be more useful if you get into rough weather. The catamaran, on the other hand, that is going to be a much faster vessel, and so it'll be easier to get out of the way of bad weather for a catamaran. I will say catamarans, especially if we're talking smaller applications like yachts, uh, 
Catamarans do have an Achilles heel, which is that the design of that cross deck structure that connects the two hulls, that cross deck structure is extremely critical. You cannot design that with simplified formulas. Uh, it almost always has to be designed with finite element analysis. And that can be a problem if you have a yacht producer that wants to minimize their budget and doesn't want to pay for that. And that can become a, an additional risk. So my only caveat to catamarans is the same thing that I would say for any hull is they are wonderful, assuming the people that did it double-checked all of their numbers and really focused on safety above cost. Okay, uh, let's see. If I don't see any more questions popping in. And we are at the hour mark, so I'm going to say we'll end the live stream here, and thank you very much for all of your questions. Uh, we will be having part two of this series coming up in a couple weeks, so I'll see you all then. Thanks very much.